Hello, everyone. My name is Colette Mello. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios. Today we're here with artist Keith Allen Spencer. I'd like to thank Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Keith Spencer is an Ohio-based artist and educator that works in painting and videos. His colorful geometric abstractions are a hybrid of painting and sculptures. The quirky, fun, irregular shaped works have an energy that transform unexpected spaces. Recent group exhibitions consist of Central Park Gallery, Los Angeles, Present Company, New York City, New Gallery at Ease Klein Archives in Paris, and Big Medium in Austin, Texas. Recent solo shows include Yolato Love in Spain, Fringe Projects in Miami, Ditch Projects in Oregon, The Composing Rooms in Berlin, Welcome Screen in London, and OFG.XXX in Dallas, as well as Target in Indiana and Domino's Pizza in Rhode Island. He is also on view here at Miami Beach Urban Studios in the Washington Gallery with the exhibition titled Nice Fight, which features works that are in collaboration with 13 FIU art students under the curatorial guidance of Professor Tom Cicluna. Spencer received his MFA in painting from the Rhode Island School of Fine Arts and a BFA from the University of Texas, El Paso. He is an art professor at Denson University. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that if you have comments or questions to make them through the chat function and we'll get to them throughout our conversation this evening. Hi, Key, thank you for joining us. Hi, Colette. Hey, everybody. Thanks for, um, for dropping in and I really appreciate the opportunity really grateful. Professor Thomas Acuna, thanks so much. And your students, your sculpture students, we'll give a, a name shout out to all the participants in a little bit, but really grateful for this, this, this experience. I'm really, really happy to, to be here and share it with you. Should I, should I get going? Should I, sure, should I yeah, start? go ahead and share your screen. Oh gosh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> if you all have any questions. Be nervous. Yeah. If you all have any um, questions, meanwhile, definitely feel free to to just you put them in the chat, and then we'll we'll figure it out somehow. Okay, how do I do this? Oh no! All right, I think I'm I think I'm doing it. Okay, you see this? Okay. Yeah, yes. All right. Oh, is it too late to back out? <laughs> yes. Yes. I think I need to. All right. Well, thanks everybody for, for coming here again. And I'm just going to, I need to minimize so I don't see anybody get more nervous. Uh, okay, here we go. Let me, let me move my little toolbar down here. Let's see. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to talk to you all about what my artworks make me think about. And um, I'm, I'm primarily showing you some, some recent artworks uh, to kind of give a little bit of context to the show Nice Fight that we have going on at the Washington Gallery Space, I think it's called, I believe so. Yes. Um, which is a sort of collaborative effort with the sculpture students there at FU and sort of you know, supervised with with Tom Shakuna. So here are a few of my paintings. Um, these are, for the most part, they're oil on canvas, stretch canvas, or sometimes wood panels. And I think, well, to get, to get started, I, I think my paintings, I don't really know what they mean, but I can just tell you what I, I, they make me think about. And, they make me think about landscape sometimes. So, so these paintings, they make me think about sort of the natural environment in a way. And, um, and these, are, these are not representations of landscapes. Um, they're very much like, they're very much a presentation. It's like, they're, they're sort of these non-objective abstract paintings. It's shape, it's color, it's texture, it's form, composition. It's, it is what it is, it's, it's right there in front of you. But I, 
I, I'm, I guess I'll try, to, I'll try to explain why, why these make me think about landscape in the sense that when, when, I, when I'm sort of going through the world and, uh, you know, you, you probably all have done this where we come across like a rainbow or something, or in this case, this is a, an image outside my, my front door, you know, the, the sunset, or I'm sorry, in this case, this is the sunrise, the sunrise and the colors and the atmosphere and how that's sort of in contrast with the, the elements of the landscape. And here, this, this tree that's sort of in being sort of intervened with the, the electrical wires. Like sometimes I can just get awestruck by these, these color interactions in, in our world, in our environment. And I'm just sort of like left there standing in awe. And I, I, I think it's like a gut reaction, like a very sort of like visceral um, moment for me where I'm, I'm just like, I'm just um, captivated. I, I'm not quite sure how else to put it, but it could be just like in the rippling of a lake and the reflection and these, the, the colors in the sky and how they're slowly shifting. Uh, and, or it can even be something like this, just like, it's a, it's a tree. Yeah, it's just, it's a tree, but, but maybe unknowingly, I, I start to look at these as less about like trying to identify them as these trees or bushes or, or, or sunrise. And, and I just kind of get into the fact that, that they're like these, these colors and colors and, and textures and, and direction and line. And, and, and maybe in some way I'm contemplating how I could render this like how, how could I how could I draw this or if I was to if I was to paint this sunset or if I was to paint this tree or you know or a charcoal like how would I how would I put those marks down what would that sort of look like or feel like and so I guess in some way like you know painting and drawing feeds my experience out in the world like and, and being out in the world sometimes feeds the experience of painting um, but it's kind of, like, I guess, I guess sort of painting and drawing is the excuse for me to be attentive to my surroundings. Uh, and I, sometimes I dabble in plain air painting, like this open air landscape painting. And not usually, I don't, I don't know if I consider these sort of like my, I don't know. I mean, I guess they are my art, but these feel more like exercises or, or sessions in therapy or, I mean, what I do like about these is that they, they force me to be, you know, to, to be really observant and spend time within the landscape and sort of documenting what's in front of me. And, and maybe it's sort of a moment, like a, a Zen moment where I'm, I'm really present and I can remember the brisk morning and sipping on the coffee and the smell of the oil paint. And they're just like these nice little paintings and just like, they're, they're, they're great. And, but I, I do sort of think about them in, in the sense of like texture and color and composition. And, um, and sometimes these moments, sometimes these moments aren't ne necessarily like natural phenomena where it's like a sunrise or something. I mean, sometimes I'll just be entranced by these color interactions that happen all over the place, you know? And, and like, I sort of refer these to as non-drawing drawings or like non-painting paintings. Um, so an example, right? Just like a regular, ordinary, mundane lawn chair where you have these bands of, of yellow and green intertwined. And I just kind of geek out on those, those color mixtures that are occurring. Like the, the, the intersections of these bands, how it's the same material, but how do you know if it's overlapping or how do you know if it's going under the green? And what are those colors? How would I paint those colors? So I... And I guess photography sort of is a way for me to, to capture those moments and just like revisit. So I, I kind of like archive these, these moments quite a bit. You know, even, even just how like really simple stuff, you know, like it's not a rainbow, this really beautiful sunset or whatever, but it can be a, something as simple as a, a shadow being cast on a, on a birthday party napkin. And I'm just like, I'm just like, wow, I'm just really into it. I just sit there gazing at it. This is another another painting, plain air painting. But I get I guess I guess my I guess my paintings maybe think about landscape in the way that maybe I'm trying to create these moments similar to what is sort of you know captivating me in in the environment. Like these are sort of they're all my own kind of 
fabrications of these color interactions, or I'm hoping to sort of be moved by them, but maybe still remaining still. Like I'm, I'm just like really in, in awe of what's, what's happening. And sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. I'm, like, I, I'm looking at this, this painting with color and shapes and form. And, and sometimes I can separate myself from, from being the maker. And I'm just sitting back viewing and just like really soaking it in, appreciating it. Can you discuss the title of this work? Oh, the Joy of Stress DVD. Yeah, that was, um, I can't remember how it came up, came to be, but oh, I can't remember the person's name. Uh, Loretta LaRoche, I think was her name, that, sort of like a motivational speaker. Um, and the Joy of Stress was a, a DVD that, that um, Loretta LaRoche put out to get people not to sort of sweat the small stuff. Um, so were you listening to her while you made this or is that no. part of your practice listening to what is part of your practice when you rituals? I, well, I guess it varies. I mean, I typically, I don't usually listen to music or listen to anything, but the titles are sort of archived. There's, the titles usually are things that I overhear or things or some sort of verbiage that, that um, comes my way somehow. You know, like, and I just, I just archive these, these things that I'm, I'm hearing, which, which most of the time is like stuff my family says, or my kids say. Uh, but I think, I think the Joyous Stress DVD was something that my wife had watched from some sort of professional development from her work or something. Because it was made in 2020, so it was kind of a stressful year. So I was thinking if, the, if that would had any impact on it. Oh, uh, I don't. It, not necessarily, I can't, I can't remember. I mean, I think, I think the, the titles don't necessarily correlate with the painting in the way of any sort of significance. It's more of like a, a placeholder. I think finding those connections, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely all about it. Like now that you say it, like, yeah, that, that would be a good DVD to watch during 2020 for sure. And I know it was sort of a way for me seeing segments of, we didn't, we never got the DVD, but we saw the YouTube videos. Seeing those videos was a way to help you um, laugh at yourself and as a way to not take yourself so seriously. And I, you know, I think actually now that, now that we're talking about it, or I'm talking about it, um, that I was sort of going through a moment, this is when I was on sabbatical actually, during when the whole pivot occurred in 2020. Yeah. And I was in a moment where I wasn't really making painting so much. I was, I felt that I was stuck or bored and I was doing a lot of drawing and I was trying to draw or make works that were kind of like cartoons of my paintings. Like what was, what would be, so, if I had, a, if I had to make a cartoon of my artwork, what might it look like? What was the sort of joke of my practice? And those drawing, those drawings came out. I think the DVD did sort of, uh, informs some of that that logic and this is actually one of those paintings that was made from trying to make a joke about my own art it's on the website you do talk about your artwork being cartoonish yeah i think so i feel i feel like it's um i i have sort of used that mantra for a while like where where my painting is like a cartoon of painting where i'm I'm trying not to take myself too seriously. And that in some way, maybe I'm, I'm scoffing or laughing at um, maybe the sort of stuffiness that surrounds art in general or painting. And maybe, maybe it's a way to sort of separate myself. I'm not sure if I, I, if, I, I, if, I'm, if I fit necessarily. So it's, it's kind of like a critical approach, but it's also me trying not to be too serious about it. It definitely has a lighthearted feel. Yeah, I, I, I like, I, I'm really serious about playing. It's like a serious, you know, serious playfulness. See? <laughs> but I think all those paintings are, are kind, of, kind of like that. It's like this, you know, 
trying to make a, a, a joke painting in a way. And I don't, I, mean, I don't know, maybe that's a, maybe I, I want to rethink that, that statement, but I, the idea of the idea about the cartoon of a painting or of a, of a painting practice maybe could be like revealed a little bit more as, as I go through the images. But I, I guess I was thinking about, yeah, so you look at, you can, we're kind of getting a, a sense of that playfulness and I, this, this sort of segue was going to be me kind of trying to figure out like, all right, it, yeah, maybe my paintings are, are trying to be this nat, you know, artificial natural phenomena that's occurring, this color interactions where I can be um, sort of awestruck by, but then that doesn't necessarily explain why my paintings look the way they do, you know? So it's like, how, why do my artworks look the way they do? And I think maybe looking back at my, my years of being young, like, you know, my formative years, adolescence, you know, so the eighties, nineties era, neon seemed to be everywhere. The sort of like spunky drop shadow, squiggly lines, aesthetic that was sort of permeating what, what I kind of felt was popular culture. Um, I mean, this wasn't completely everywhere necessarily, but these were the sort of things that I was absorbing during that time period. And when I look at my paintings now, and some of the ones I just showed, I, I feel like I, I see this connection. It's not, I'm not conscious about it. I'm not, I'm not trying to create like this nostalgic feel to the 80s, 90s era with my paintings. It's just like when I reflect upon my paintings, this is kind of like what I think about when I, you know, regarding color schemes or composition or, or formatting. You know, and particularly it's like, I listened, you know, I'll, back in those days, I was listening to a lot of rap music and I still do, but you know, this, this white kid listening to, to rap music, you know, sort of being part of hip hop culture in the nineties. And you know, specifically De La Soul was really you know, uh, influential to me. The, the sort of like weird quirkiness vibe that they gave off um, was kind of the music that I was first introduced to during the like, middle school era. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of like showing you some visuals of, of as far as like the things that I was taking in and how it sort of like has filtered through me. And maybe this is in my, you know, the, the back of my mind somehow, like entering into the works. You know, again, like this is this, uh, this white kid going home, racing home after middle school. To, to hang out with my best friend at the time, Mike Lee, so we can watch Rap City on BET, Black Entertainment Television. And, you know, that was like, I think really important, like this sort of like this, this culture that I was, you know, was taken in along with basketball. I played basketball a lot. So, you know, I, I think some of those visuals are really like deep in my, in my psyche, but then also where I was raised, like where is home? Home is, is El Paso, Texas. And that, El Paso, Texas is the westernmost point in Texas. It's on the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, you can see in the background there, that's the sister city on the Mexican side. The city is called La Ciudad Juarez. In the foreground, in the middle, is downtown El Paso. Uh, and you can even see, and maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I can zoom in here. This part here is a port of entry. That's where you, can, you drive over back and forth one of the one of the port of entries there. The reason why I think that's important is because you know growing up on the border is pretty. I feel like it's a pretty diverse region. I mean, it's it's mainly saturated with people from Mexican heritage. Um, but you know, when you it's not that dissimilar from other places, other cities. I mean, like you have sort of like the malls and the shopping centers and suburban areas. But when you kind of get closer into those regions that were more um, populated with, with Mexican Americans or Mexican um, people of an, that ancestry, the sort of architecture and the landscape would change a little bit. Like there was definitely like an embracing of color and like a contrast of, of color, very brilliant, intense hues being selected. Um, and it, especially when you cross over into, into Juarez, into to Mexico, this is a shot of the Mercado there, the, the market where you can hang out at. But I mean, it's sort of like everywhere. There's like hand-painted signage. There's murals all over the place. Color is embraced. It's not, it's not toned down. Um, you know, the car culture there, it's not, 
it's not atypical to to sometimes see customized vehicles rolling around so like you know lowrider car culture was was sort of things like not that i was into lowriders but it's just kind of like you know things that i would sort of see and even if they weren't lowriders there were these cars that had been modified you know so like that i think that intense brilliant coloration all you know surrounding me not only in the architecture and in my environment but then like going home and, and listening to rap music and watching the music videos like i think those things you know had it had an impact on me and just because the paintings are abstract you know doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have some sort of other other meaning necessarily and I, I don't know i came i came across this quote by felix gonzalez torres who is a an artist kind of uh 80s. I don't remember when he he passed away. I think maybe 80s, 90s. But multidisciplinary artist and um, gay rights activist. But I, I came across this quote. Not he's not a painter. Some people say aesthetics and politics are different. Uh, I say the best thing about aesthetics is that the politics which permeate it are totally invisible, because when we speak about aesthetics, we are talking about a whole set of rules that were established by somebody. We were not born with a set of aesthetic rules in our hands, were we? Aesthetics are not about politics. They are politics themselves. And this is how the political can be best utilized since it appears so natural. The most successful of all political moves are ones that don't appear to be political. Now, I don't know, I'm not saying necessarily my works are, are political, I mean, but I think that regarding the context, you know, like context shapes content. So thinking about how my, how the things that I was raised on and brought up to and informed upon you know, I think, I think bring meaning to the work. Oops. Anyways, just kind of an example of that. Th these are, these are two paintings that I had applied with to graduate school. And you can see that, you know, the sort of formal visual characteristics are pretty similar to the work I do now, you know, like large shapes of color, I'm interested in like composition and texture, um, you know, the shapes of color and sort of different variations of surface quality. But these were these were act, these are representations of a landscape, and and particularly these these were like these um, imagined environments that I potentially would have trekked through in my younger years. So thinking about graffiti, writing graffiti, and being a part of skateboard culture. Um, you know, like alleyways, the back of industrial complexes or, or factories or, or train yards are, and these sort of like grimy, decaying areas that you, that I um, would inhabit sometimes. And so I'm kind of like, you know, representing these, these areas through this painting and to, to try to help solidify that there are these landscapes, I would, I would collage these these characters on the bottom of the paintings, kind of hard to tell, it's a bad, I don't have a detail shot, but these, these characters were actually cutouts from my CD covers. Um, so like these rap artists from the 80s and 90s, this one is, is a crisscross from the 80s and 90s, um, maybe early 90s more. But, you know, I, I, the reason why I bring this up is because I can't shrink this, oh, the reason why I bring this up is because when, when I had applied to grad school and I was, I was in graduate school, I had a mentor of mine tell me that, that when he saw these paintings, that he thought, he thought that I was a black guy. And didn't really think much about it at the time, just kind of like maybe like chuckled about it and that was it and just sort of like moved on. But um, I think now, like looking back upon this work and, and just thinking forward, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't make this kind of work going forward. You know, I, I, I think that is problematic, and I think that it is sort of upholding um, and you know contributing to some like negative assumptions about black and brown bodies. You know, to, to be frank, and and I know some people might be like, ah, oh, it's just a painting. What's the big deal? Those are the you know rap. Those are like those people you listen to, the rap artists, and you're just like making paintings about about your life and who you are. And it's just it's art. You know, who cares? It's just being creative. But I, I do kind of feel like I need to take some responsibility or we need to take some responsibility as, you know, creatives and artists and, and what we're putting out in the world. And, and I mean, I think the problem with this painting is that if, if I'm, 
you know, me being a white guy, sort of putting these characters, which are, are black and brown bodies into a landscape that is, um, that is a site of, you know, that is, has so these connotations of crime and mischief and ruin and deterioration. You know, I'm sort of, I'm sort of kind of making like this guilty by association thing. Like I'm, I'm putting these, these negative assumptions on these characters by putting them in this environment. And sure, it's just a, it's just a painting, you know, that's fine. But I do, I do feel like these, these, these kind of methods even though it wasn't conscious, you know, like it is sort of perpetuating uh, white supremacy to be honest. Like I, 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 and I don't want to do that. I want, I want to be better. I want, I want to be, I want to embrace diversity. I want to embrace inclusivity. I want to, you know, go forward with being more equitable and definitely want to, you know, strive for being anti-racist. And anybody that tells you they're not, they're not racist, I'll tell you right now, they're racist, okay? I and that's not a bad thing like I, I I don't want to be racist I am I am I straight I am racist because it is deep within our sort of subconscious these things that are happening and this is a this is an example and and here are some other examples you know like right like the bad guy is always is always wearing black you know a black cat crosses your path bad luck a crow that's a that's a sign of a bad omen licorice Yuck! Oh, I, I kind of like licorice actually, but it has a bad rap, right? Devil's cake, dark chocolate, angel's cake, white. You know, so it's like if if we, I think all these little these little subtleties add up, and they sort of they dig deep into our to the back of our minds, and it's just like perpetuating. It's been it's continuing these these ideas that are hurtful to to groups of people like. It wouldn't be such a big deal, perhaps, if if we didn't if we didn't use language to identify these objects and then you know put on meaning to to color and thus the objects, and then then to groups of people it wouldn't be an issue. But you know we're we're going to continue to identify uh, groups of people in this way. So like, you know it's capital B black for our our black community, and you know. If we continue to use negative tropes, um, and then those are, and then we use the term black associated with people, that's problematic. I mean, I th frankly, I think that's, that's why there's such an issue with law enforcement quick to pull the trigger on, on you know, people of, of black and brown bodies. Like it's just it's so embedded into our minds that that we're quick to judge and make these assumptions about being like, you know, criminally in invested or monsters or dangerous or whatever. Right, like this has been going on for like centuries and centuries. All done. Now you each have a personal bodyguard against the flu. Cool. Okay. You'd be surprised where the flu shows up. Hi, is a. Uh... Just imagine if everybody got a flu shot. I guess I'll try that state up north. The reason why I show this commercial, this is a new commercial they had in Ohio to get the flu shot. The reason why I think this is, this is important to show is because this is like, like one of the few examples where I've seen where they have actually like reversed the roles of where black and white are used to connote like good or bad. You know, like the flu here is wearing a white shirt. The flu shot, which is good, the vaccination is good. Um, is wearing black. So I, I kind of like really appreciated that there was this, this inversion that occurred. And I'm, I'm really curious to, to maybe talk to the design firm of this commercial to see if, if they're intentional, like if that is a deliberate thing. But it seems like it's an important sort of strategy to, to try to like undermine you know, um, these, these like subtle workings into our subconscious of, of, a, of a color usage. I think another way maybe is like just to to sort of, you know, here, here is a white pyramid, right? But no, it's, it's, not, it's not really white. It's like, it's like a, a cool tint of a color. It's sort of like a more like lavender kind of color on top, maybe a little bit darker color. So there's like these chromatic whites, you know, so 
And I, I think for me, like sort of paying attention to these subtleties in color is a way to, to recognize that there is this sort of myth of, of a, a kind of purity to white. And if you just can like recognize this alone, that it's not actually a white pyramid, it is subtle and it's sort of chromatic shifts. You know, and I think that can be kind of like a metaphor for, you know, how we associate white with um, other things, you know, groups of people, for example, right? Like there's no sort of like pure white supreme version. And same thing with black or browns or reds, like there's chromatic black, there's chromatic browns, They're not monolithic. I think about color, I think about like goofy, silly, maybe frivolous or not serious, psychedelics, hallucinogens, drugs, the foreign body, that's my wife, the queer body, LGBTQ plus community, the feminine, cosmetics, superficial, maybe deception. So I think even color in some way can have like, you know, some, some negative correlations. Um, I guess depending how it's used, but maybe the way color is used in my artworks is I, I feel that I am conscious about the color choices in, in, in some way, at least in re upon reflection and talking about it, that I wanna sort of align myself with these groups. I wanna sort of show some camaraderie and um, and I'm okay with the paint sort of acting like a skin. Like I don't I don't see it as being deceptive. I mean I think it does kind of create an identity for a work or for a person. Um, and I think it's important to sort of identify. But you know the paintings are also sort of sculptural in a way because I I, I want it to be integral. I don't want it to be like there's a sort of hierarchy involved. Like that one component is better or more important than the other. You know, just kind of like the rainbow spectrum. Like it's all necessary. It's all relevant. There's not there's not a sort of a dominant color or a dominant form between these pairings. And so I think a lot of times that's why my, my paintings take on these like regular shapes. That the painting is cannot be the skin cannot be out without the form. The form cannot be without the skin. They sort of like they need each other. Not one is better than the other. I don't always paint that way. I mean, sometimes I just paint on a you know, regular rectangle stretch canvas, but, but typically not. There's, I mean, I think sort of like the, the objectness of it is, is pretty, pretty important. These are hung with uh, magnets, it's like these plastic, plastic tart paintings. And these are held with magnets to the wall, but instead of magnets, I will use like these props to cover the magnets. The props are, are typically like um, junk drawer items that I have or snacks. So it's kind of a way to sort of embed my family dynamic a little bit into the, the paintings. And then thinking about color, you know, where these are sort of like vehicles to carry color, these paintings. And, and if it's carrying color, it's also carrying meaning. And it's carrying this sort of like an association to these other groups that I want to align myself with. And, and I, I feel like color is also an indication of, of like the sense of freedom and individualism and um, diversity. So again, like there's, like there's no really hierarchy. It, it, I, I don't want there to be necessarily a standard to do something. I want to sort of like poke at these sort of environments or systems. So a lot of times how I install the work, I will purposefully look for those areas that are not considered or you know, they're overlooked or they're the interstitial spaces, or they're the, they're the areas or objects on the wall that maybe you wouldn't want to have your painting next to um, typically because it's not deemed appropriate or maybe it's deemed a distraction. So I felt like the painting sort of catalyzed these other things to happen. It's, like, it's not just about the painting, but it's like about what the painting can kind of respond and react to. And that even goes with the, the title, the titles, the media descriptions, all that to me is like part of, they're all, they're all tethered to the painting. The painting like catalyzes these different things to happen, these different kind of like creative explorations. 
so this is a this is a real long title of this painting. So installation is kind of like interventions or disruptions of the space, but I don't really it, that maybe sounds aggressive. I, to me, it's just trying to like trying to be observant of ways that that we traditionally or maybe I would not typically use a space. Eye level centered, trying to find some way where you would not want to put a painting or not install it and do it and, and sort of see what happens. Embrace these areas that maybe are unexpected, not typical, not usual. And this has been going on for a while in the corner, on a corner, hang paintings on the pedestal. Sometimes impermissibly in spaces. This is a YMCA in Providence, Rhode Island. There's a plaque missing. I put a painting there. This is Target in Indiana. Put a painting up there by the water fountain. And those, those spaces that I'm sort of using the paintings to infiltrate and uh, maybe like interrogate a little bit, it's not just physical space. It's also like online space. So, like, so in that way, like, I can make animated GIFs. I can make videos. Um, any sort of way that the paintings can, can create a different kind of reaction to its environment. Here's a quick video. the whole time the whole the whole minute so these are just more like recent works I'm, I'm kind of wrapping it up but um yeah um same idea sculptural type of paintings um thinking about like some of these i even like the, the photograph better than the painting themselves that happens a lot where i'm, I'm more interested in the image how, how it lives on in the photograph so, so these more recent ones i'm kind of like looking for these like these backgrounds that seem you know typically um, standard neutral or white background, but then something's off about them a little bit. You know, it has some kind of texture, and then th they're they're not hung actually horizontally. They're they're tilted. This is nice fight. This is the the painting that's titled after the show, and the this painting is not in the show at the Washington Gallery, um, but I did use a sort of this kind of like digital collage that I made of documenting the the painting. So I actually like this sort of format of the artwork better than the painting. And I usually will name the, a show after a painting if I have the opportunity to. So it's like, when do I get to show this image? And it's like, oh, it seems appropriate to use it for the promotional material. So I, I, I like how maybe the actual physical painting never even gets exhibited, but here on this stage, you know, like it has extended into a different kind of format. So here's Nice Fight. Um, the show looks really exciting. I, I, I really wanted to go down there and see it in person. I do, I do want to give a big thanks to, um, I'm, I'm going to try to pronounce your names correctly. I'm sorry if I, if I don't get it right. Um, Kamsha Kluna, for one, for supervising this and helping make the connections. Marie Lucy Cran, Imani Fagan, Abril Yerena, Douglas Lora, Fernando Marquez, Alexis McKinnon. Monia Meluzzi, Marco Ordonez Dominguez, Alondra, um, Alondra Samoya, uh, James Stewart, Sofia Villanueva, Imani Dean, and Caitlin Jackson. Thank you all for, for participating and making this show possible. Um, I, it has been like really super fruitful to me seeing these paintings or these paint or wall things be uh, developed. And it is still kind of like continuing and evolving, it feels like. Um, you're making me sort of see, see these, these works come to, to life in ways that I could never have imagined. I don't think I've ever done a collaboration before um, in this kind of capacity. And so it makes, me, it makes me, it gives me like a lot of different kind of possibilities. Like this, that one on the lower right hand corner, I, I, never, I never would have imagined making something like that. 
So I'm, I'm really excited about this and, and we could talk more about, I, was, I just wanted to do a quick process of, of this. So for those that don't know, um, the idea was that they're gonna help me, that we're gonna make these sort of like sculptural paintings together and you know, sort of informed on my painting practice, they would send me a drawing of a shape, rough dimensions. I would then sort of put that onto canvas you can sort of see me here kind of like loosely translating those that work onto the canvas and then i would lay it out start painting kind of think of them more like drawings not, not trying to be uh, too fussy about it just be like really direct and immediate um, low stakes got these paintings roll them up onto to ship them out they arrived in miami students were stretching them or making their armatures. And I think from the very beginning, it was like, you know, chance is embraced. It's okay to get lost in translation. You know, like, at, try to make them yours. You know, at, to what point can you sort of allow that to become more of your kind of work and not just making a frame for, for my painting? Um, and I think, you know, there's a, a real nice variety of, of ways that, that, that the work was coming together on these. There's a whole bunch of documentation. And then how they're sort of like disrupting different areas, and it's like, yes, I should be, I should be also walking around with my paintings in places. I should, I, why, why don't I do this? You know, yes, I should be documenting upside down. How come I have not done this yet? You know, it just, it just sort of makes me feel like I should be less timid. And then there's videos. There's been videos that have been made, and i've been taking some of these videos and and also playing with them and sort of continuing the collaboration i don't think this was part of the deal initially but um i went ahead and just went for it i'm almost there almost done so this is not the video that you all made but i sort of took the creative liberty and just like a, a you know change it up a little bit I mean, this, I, I mean, okay. Thank you all so much for, for doing this. I'm, I'm really like super excited by it. Oh, this got messed up. Oops, this is a mess up. I don't know what's going on here. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, and I want to just, you know, on your comments you made about your agency as an artist, I think that's really important to hear from that you, you know, you have this thought process about your artwork and it doesn't really come out in the art making, I think, because it has, but behind the scenes, it's nice to hear that. Um, and then I, I have a couple questions. I want to open it up for questions for anyone. Please put your comments or questions in the chat. Um, I had one question. Hold on. Let's see if I can get to it. Um, Paintings are alive, they have voices. So it is important to question what they might be saying in addition to what you are expressing. Do you agree? Can you, okay, one more time. Can you read that? Sure, that by it, says, it says paintings are alive, they have voices. So it is important to question what they might be saying in addition to what you are expressing. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I think that the work is separate from whatever the artist might intend. I mean, it's a two-way street, right? Like I might intend to make something, I think because you know, by the nature of art, for the most part, it's interpretive. And you know, like that, what is communicating back to the person is maybe completely different than what I am hoping for. So it's, I think it's just as, as necessary and relevant. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Okay. But you can, you do have that agency where you can title it and you can write what you want about your artwork. So people do have your voice behind it. Um, and yeah, then sure. 
I, and I wanted to mention when we talk about agency and what you're talking about, you know, color. And I was thinking of the exhibition um, with Dana Schultz that she was at the Whitney and she did an exhibition about Emmett Teal and she, um, there was a lot of controversy about it, yeah. uh, about that. And that made me, when you were talking about your agency, uh, that's what I started thinking about. And also I was thinking about um, the exhibition that was um, that in, in the summer from, um, it was supposed to be at the Tate Modern, I think, and at the Metropolitan, um, Philip Guston. Oh yeah, yeah, it got, it got was, canceled. Yeah, they, they postponed it or they canceled it and it was about um, the KKK and they, they indicated that they didn't have enough information to exhibit the work yet. So they wanted to take time to go back and um, relook at the exhibition and, and bring that out. But those were things that I was thinking about when you were talking about your work. Um, another question, I have, it's uh, how do you address artwork storage issues when you started out? I, I, I think I, well, I had tended to work small a lot of the time. So things would just kind of get packed up in boxes. And I think working small was sort of a, a strategy that I didn't want to have to work big, not for practicality reasons, but because I didn't want to kind of get lumped into the sort of like, macho, grandiose, ab X kind of painting conversation. I wanted to try to avoid that. And, and part of that was by making smaller works, which was also just pragmatic. So working small seemed to like definitely help. Some of those plastic paintings also helped. You know, I could just fold them up and they would they're kind of like a blanket. But that's a real issue now, like with the most recent stuff that is not, I can't fold it up. I mean, it's not, it's not much bigger than maybe six feet wide at times, but and yeah, what happens with it? You know, like what, like all the, like all the paintings there in the show, like what's going to, what's going to happen with those objects? That, that stuff takes up space. That's money. That's transportation. That's like, that's a carbon footprint. You know, it's just like, I think typically, my, uh, you know, my feeling is like, don't worry about that stuff, but I can't not, not worry about it. It, it is, it is a challenge. Um, I have another question here. Love the presentation. With the long history of heroic painting, do you think your paintings are anti-heroic? Is that a way for you to combat these ideas of white supremacy? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've been conscious about that. I, I guess I... I have, people have told me my, my paintings were like this sort of abject modernism and maybe in some way that's connected. Um, I don't know. I, I guess part of me wants to like not, like, I don't know if I'm anti-heroic, but I guess I don't really want to, oh, I have to kind of sit with that one for a while. That's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I wanted to ask you about the process of working with the students, and I, I want to open it up to the students as well that were part of this, and, and Tom Sakluna. Um, what was most surprising to you all about the outcome or the process of working with Keith? Anything surprise you about it? Okay. No? Um, yes, sorry. Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi, Colette. This is Caitlin. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Keith, again. Um, the whole thing was surprising for me, like, if I have to be honest. And I really like that aspect because it was kind of just like, take what you get and then, you know, work with that. So I enjoyed it. So the whole process for me was a little bit of a surprise. And then Professor Thomas had told us to use scraps and kind of work with that. So that was really helpful. So um, hopefully more surprises along the way for uh, collaborations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Tom and Caitlin. Any other students would like to say anything about the process? I can unmute you. Oh, um, I, um, I, th I thought it was very fun to do. And it was interesting that everybody made their different frames and how they try to frame each artwork. So like, yeah, everybody had their different like perspective on how they want to do it. And it was really fun. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, so Keith, when I look at your work, I get the feel and you, and you talked about it a little bit about landscape. And I wanted to think in, it's, it's an abstraction, but do you, is there some particular artistic figure in history has, that, that you feel has had any influence on your work? Um, I like, I mean, what, as soon as you said that, I, I went to Elizabeth Murray. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Murray sort of coming out of the 70s, painting as dead era. I think she probably died maybe several years ago. But it's kind of like cartoony, abstract, sort of, you know, physical, sculptural type paintings. But I remember I heard, I mean, I think if you see Elizabeth Murray's work, you'll see it's definitely like a visual formal connection, you know, influence to me. But I think there was something that, that she had said one time in an Art 21 video that was like, um, having, having, having kids or having a family allows you to have a life other than your own. And um, that kind of just like really sort of stuck with me and resonated with me. And that, you know, sort of upended this kind of assumption or expectation about like what an artist maybe should look like or, or be like. And if, if having a family is sort of like anti is, an, is an antithesis to that in a way. And so hearing this artist, I really looked up to hear that, you know, sort of really um, cemented the idea that no, like if anything, it could be um, a positive, it could be like influential and and so there's no doubt that the work that I make now couldn't be happening without, you know, the support of my, my family and my kids. So Elizabeth Murray, for sure, comes to my mind. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask one more question. Where you, your audience is mostly students, but I wanted, do you have any advice for some of our student artists going out in the world, what it's like to be a professional artist or how to live that creative life? Uh, yeah, let's see. I think that um, there's a lot of gray area in between, you know, between being that that small fraction of those who, you know, I don't know, are making a lot of money and have this sort of idea of, of success that you are represented by a gallery or whatever, but like you're just making work all day long. And then the other end of that spectrum is that you're like a starving artist. I think there's like a real wide range in between that. And, you know, most artists are supplementing their income in some way or another and so don't be disappointed if you fall within that because we're all I think probably all of us who are artists are doing that in some way or another and that if you are interested in making art and you want to like it to art then um, you know definitely co continue to pursue your interest and keep keep making it be around a community whether it's school or otherwise outside and and keep those conversations going and you know success is something subjective and, um, you know, you could do it. That's good advice. I like that. Success is subjective. Yes. So, so I want to say, I'm going to ask everyone to, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute and, um, give you some virtual applause. Thank you again for joining us. Your exhibition and the students exhibition downstairs is, is really fantastic. I love it. It was really nice to work with everyone on this. Thank you, Tom, for, um, recommending Keith to us and we have a beautiful exhibition and the students were involved and I just want to say thank you again everyone and um, we'll see you next Monday on another art talk um, so have a good night thank you again Keith so nice to meet you, I hope you make it down to Miami sometime soon thank you Bye.